uh, survey A and then uh, M through Z or whatever got survey B. So it's probably like pretty random. It's not totally random. Uh, in particular, like if different ethnicities were more or less likely to have last names occurring like you know, earlier or later in the alphabet, then there could have been some correlation there. But I suspect that it's sort of like second or third order. Um, some individual answers. So two people answered twenty dollars even on survey A. I, I didn't have a chance to check whether they were both males. I know that like last year I had three people answered twenty dollars and they were all males. Um, but so they answered twenty dollars even on survey A where the probabilities are attached. So if we do the BSL calculation of willingness to pay, which is twenty bucks over um, over the uh, difference in the risk, it, it implies a very low BSL of only four hundred thousand um, dollars. So that's more of like a you might get that answer in like a middle income country or below. Uh, nobody answered below one hundred dollars on survey B. So that was the, the how much we have to pay you to drive around. Um, and then this last, uh, so this last like um, uh, question was about uh, your willingness to pay or your willingness to accept to, for avoiding the uh, oil drilling. And the thing that actually was unplanned here, but that I find a little bit interesting, is that this uh, the answers to the survey have risen significantly after 2009. So the first time I gave this survey uh, was before the BP oil uh, spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and it turned out that the values that people answered back then were substantially lower. And I gave it in 2010, which was after, and there was like a big spike. And now it's like receded a little bit. And to be honest, I expected to kind of continue receding somewhat over time. Um, so the answer for that question. Oh, so I, I should also say. Um, a versus B, again, there's a difference. Now it doesn't have to do with probabilities. So I think on survey A, you were asked how much would you be, uh, actually, I don't remember which, but on one, you were asked how much would you uh, have to, or how much would we need to pay you, so what's your willingness to accept in order to allow drilling. Uh, and so the scenario is like that the taxpayers already have the rights to prevent drilling, uh, and the oil company has to come and buy it from them. And then in the second uh, case, it was flipped around. So then basically the oil company had the rights, and the question was how much would you be willing to be taxed in order to uh, sell those rights to, uh, to the uh, oil company, or, or sorry, to get those rights back from the oil company and prevent drilling. So if you take it across both of the surveys, the uh, mean value was like $313,000 out there. But as you might expect, there's a huge difference in willingness to pay versus willingness to accept here. And now like, we're getting into numbers that really, you know, lifetime wealth does become relevant. Um, so the mean willingness to pay to avoid the drilling was $48,000. I should say, you know, that's usually, I think, always like, driven mainly by a few outliers. People who are saying they're willing to pay is like a million dollars. Again, that shows the, one of the problems with use, using stated preferences surveys, because I can pretty much guarantee, unless there's like a bunch of very uh, environmentally conscious trust fund kids who have a lot of wealth in this class, that uh, nobody is actually willing to pay a million dollars to prevent this. Uh, the willingness to accept uh, is much higher. It's like basically 10 times higher, a little bit more than 10 times higher. So it's like $565,000. Again, so this is at least more realistic in that now it's like economically feasible that you could refuse to accept that. Um, although, again, uh, I'm somewhat doubtful that people are actually, uh, like if you came to them with a proposal, it's like I'll give you a million dollars if you allow drilling off the coast. I'm somewhat skeptical that most people will walk away from that. Um, uh, so, yeah, so one person was in fact willing to pay a million dollars to avoid drilling. Uh, and then 55% of the majority of people actually uh, needed a million dollars to allow the drilling, uh, which was almost double the 2009. Number. So this is like we're like post uh, Mexican, Gulf of Mexico uh, oil spill here. Uh, the willingness to accept if you compare. Uh, pre-2000 or pre-2010 to, to now rose from like 326 to 565,000. And the willingness to pay actually rose even more in um, proportional terms. So it's basically 10 times now uh, what it used to be. But it's actually down from 2010, which is like right after the oil spill when it was like almost $150,000. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much uh, a summary of uh, what happened with all the survey responses. Okay, so then in the last like 15 minutes here, um, I'm just gonna, we're, we're gonna talk about uh, the actual evidence on the values of this like from, um, from uh, the US overall. So, so there's these US labor market studies. Uh, and it turns out that these labor market studies estimate a huge sort of range of value VSLs um, when you look at them. So some studies estimate something as low as $500,000. The highest study I think that they cite goes up to $21 million. And the idea here is that what these studies are doing is they're regressing wages on uh, job risk and other job or worker characteristics. So this is like a revealed preferences approach. Um, and the idea is it's this compensating wage differential idea that essentially in order to take a riskier job, you need to be paid more. And so we can measure the risk of the job and we can measure how much you're paid. So the latter is quite easy, you know, as long as you have some sort of wage survey data. Um, so if we can measure those things and we could regress your pay on the amount of risk that your job involves and essentially find out how much you need to be paid uh, in order to take jobs at different risk levels. The problem though, of course, is that um, the risk level is going to be uh, correlated with other characteristics. So in the, the survey paper, they have dozens of studies with a wide range of estimates there. Um, but the two problems here are, first of all, there's an omitted variable bias problem. Uh, so the unobservable traits of the workers and the jobs are probably correlated with job safety. So like a, um, like a classical example of, say, a risky job would be something like coal mining, uh, which is definitely very dangerous. And you see articles probably every couple of years, something about like a mine collapsing or something and the trapped under there. And um, you know, that type of thing doesn't usually happen if you're just working in like, an office building. Um, so undoubtedly, coal mining is risky. And undoubtedly, people have to be paid more to engage in coal mining than they would have to be paid to engage in an equivalent job that was less risky. Uh, but it also turns out that coal mining is just like terrible on lots of other dimensions, right? So it's really dirty. It gets like really hot down there, believe it or not. And, uh, it's just kind of a terrible job to do in general. Um, and so people need to really be paid more, not just because of the danger, but also because they're working in these really dirty conditions and uh, you know, it's just very uncomfortable. Um, so there's sort of some bias coming in there. And then there's also some bias in terms of like the unobservable traits of the workers. So usually people who are engaged in that, uh, in that occupation would probably not choose to, to do it if they had like a better opportunity. Um, but they're probably not people who have like college degrees and so forth and could get like a higher paying job in an office. So there's all these other variables that affect somebody's wages uh, and affect their willingness to, to take a job at a given wage. Um, and unless we can control for all of these characteristics of both the jobs and workers that could be correlated with the, the risk here, uh, it, it'll be hard to, to get the exact, um, an estimate of the, the actual BSL that we're interested in here. Uh, the second problem is that you could think that uh, the people who accept these jobs are sort of not really a representative sample of the overall population, right? So particularly when you're talking about something like um, maybe like coal mining or like uh, going to Alaska and working on like a fishing boat or something, which is another dangerous job, or like being one of those like ice road truckers or something, or going to like Afghanistan to drive trucks under combat conditions. Um, you know, the people who engage in those uh, occupations are, first of all, like stereotypically, they're generally younger males who have a higher tolerance of risk. And just in general, it's gonna be somebody who has a higher tolerance of risk, right? If you're a very risk averse person, which is the same thing that you have a really high DSL, then it's unlikely that you're gonna be the guy who goes and drives like trucks on icy roads in Alaska or something like that, right? So in some sense, you could actually think that these types of studies are probably underestimating the overall average DSL in the population because what they're basically estimating is how much you have to pay somebody who's not very risk averse to
And the idea here is basically related to, uh, to what you guys are doing with airbags. So, so what they're going to do is, the, in these studies, they're going to observe the purchases of things like uh, automobiles with the associated safety equipment, uh, or something like a smoke detector, uh, or a bike helmet, or um, how much people are willing to pay to live in a house near a toxic waste site versus one that's further away. Um, and so in all these cases, you're, you're basically looking at uh, goods or services uh, that will increase or potentially decrease uh, your, your safety by uh, a relatively small amount. And if you can measure people's willingness to pay for these small safety improvements, uh, then you can use that to, to basically calculate the VSL. Uh, but again, there's potentially two types of problems here. Um, so one problem is, again, this omitted variables bias problem. I think it's less of a problem than in the labor market studies. I mean, in the labor market studies, for sure, the average danger drop is like worse than the average safe drop along multiple dimensions, not just the danger. Um, here, you could think about uh, potentially having uh, some sort of clean variation where the, the safety benefit of the good is really the only benefit of the good. There aren't some other traits about the good that people are also willing to pay for. So um, like uh, two examples. So we talk about purchase of autos, smoke detectors, bike helmets, housing near toxic wayside. So uh, I would say that with autos and the houses, uh, it's very clear that there could be some sort of omitted variables bias here. There could be some other characteristic that people are willing to pay uh, for other than just the safety. So like with the autos, you can think about uh, sort of choosing like a, a trim line of, so say you're looking at like a Honda Civic or something like that. Right? It has various trim lines. At the highest level, it probably has like electronic stability control, which is a, which does significantly improve safety. Uh, and at the lowest trim line, it probably doesn't, although I don't know, maybe these days it does, but five years ago it didn't. Um, and so you could look at people's willingness to pay for the higher trim line versus the lower trim line. The problem is there's also going to be like, you know, navigation features built in in the high one that aren't in the low one, and, and maybe you'll have other seats and other things. And so it'll be hard to unbundle the safety benefit from the other potential uh, uh, benefits of, of the higher trim line. Um, with houses, you, know, you can look at houses that are next to toxic waste sites and houses that are further away from toxic waste sites, uh, but I would be surprised if that were the only difference between those two groups of houses. Probably the houses that are next to toxic waste sites are not that nice on other dimensions too, in terms of like you know, the appliances and the amount of bedrooms and so forth. Um, so unless you can observe all those variables and control for them as well, you're going to still have a variable bias problem. Um, Smoke detectors, I think, uh, there you don't really have a mid-variable spice problem. Right? There's nothing, you put in a smoke detector, that there's a safety benefit, but there's not any other benefit to having a smoke detector. I guess the one way, so the smoke detectors with bike helmets, uh, bike helmets also only have safety benefit, but in those cases, I think it's actually the opposite of, um, you're getting a safety benefit, but then there's some other cost besides the monetary cost, right? So with a smoke detector, it's not big, but I guess the other cost would be that you get these false alarms uh, from time to time. So you're like cooking in the kitchen and then it goes off and then you have to like silence it. So that would make you less inclined to buy a smoke detector, all other things being equal. Uh, so with a bike helmet, like the main cost is uh, not just the money, but also the fact that maybe you feel kind of wearing a bike helmet. Uh, I'm not, you know, I wear a bike helmet when I go riding. I would endorse everybody do it, uh, but I understand that it, uh, you know, you'll feel fashionable doing it. Um, so there again, sort of like you get this benefit from, in terms of safety, there's a cost in terms of money, and then there's also maybe some sort of like aesthetic cost. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. So actually for a lot of these things, uh, they're basically regulated yeah. now. So like, uh, you know, there was a time when like airbags were optional on cars, but basically it's now standard equipment on every single car, and part of that is because of government regulations. Um, Bike helmets, like under, I think like under 18 in California, you're required to, to wear in uh, smoke detectors. Also, they're often ordinances. So then, at that point, you're right. You can't make any inferences about people's willingness to pay because you know by law they're required to, so they're not making voluntary choice anymore. Uh, the toxic waste sites, there's no regulation against building next to a toxic waste site, I guess, but uh, there is. Um, so that's that's definitely true. So you need to find something where people aren't being forced to, to buy it. Um, the second issue here is that a lot of these things are basically durable goods. You know, they're not things you just consume in a day or two or even like a few weeks. They're things that you're going to expect to last five or ten years at least. Uh, so certainly with autos and with the smoke detectors and with houses, those are things that have multi-year, if not multi-decade lifespans. And so once you start talking about something whose benefits are basically being paid out in a stream over like many, many years, then you have to start talking about discount rates, right? Because we know that people discount the future. So if we want to figure out like, so they're paying say $50 a day for a bike helmet and then maybe they'll recoup the benefits of that over a five year period. Uh, but we know that money or benefits five years from now are not uh, valued as much as benefits today. And so we need to discount those benefits, uh, but then you have to have some assumption about what people's discount rates are. And how you set the discount rate is going to determine uh, basically like what your calculation of the VSL will be. Um, and we don't have, I mean, discount rates are something we think are important, but it's not something we can observe about a person. You, know, like, you just have to make assumptions about what they are. Those assumptions might or might not be right. Okay, so then the last piece of evidence that uh, we'll summarize here are these international labor market studies. So this is the same as a U.S. labor market study, uh, but instead of being done in the U.S., it's done in another country. So you're going to regress wages on job risk in these job and worker characteristics in other countries. Uh, and just to sort of broadly summarize the, the results from these studies, the VSL estimates I think in other developed economies, so basically you're talking about like you know Western Europe and maybe Japan. Um, the VSL estimates in these economies appear roughly similar to the VSL estimates uh, in the U.S. in terms of their overall magnitude. And then as you might expect, the VSL estimates in developing economies uh, um, do not or are significantly lower than the VSL estimates from the U.S. So they also um, in the paper, they also summarize evidence on the value of statistical injury, uh, which is harder to really sort of pin down because you really have to say what kind of injury. I mean, for value of statistical life, you know, somebody's alive or not, so there's not so much of an issue there. But if you're talking about a serious injury, there's sort of varying degrees of injury. Um, and they also uh, do look at this thing that we discussed earlier, which is the income elasticity of the VSL. So just, I don't expect you to look at that part, but just to sort of briefly summarize, I think the central value that they come up with is maybe about 0 0.5. So what that's implying is that if people's income doubles, then their VSL, their value of statistical life, might go up by about 50% or so. Um, so it's a strong relationship. It's not one to one, uh, but it's definitely a pretty strong relationship. Okay, so that's it, I think, and we will uh, meet you on Monday and continue with the slime inquiry.